Okay, well, Stephanie, um, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being with us. Why don't we just jump in? Can you tell me what was going on uh, when you first decided to seek out psychotherapy? Yes, yeah, so um, I was 18 years old in grade 12, and my OCD started when I think I just was like the idea just popped in my head. What if I'm lesbian? And once I had that thought, I just, it kind of all just spiraled from there. And I was like, why would I have that thought? What does it mean? And then everywhere I looked, I would see sexual or violent images and it was like really visual and really scary at the start. So like, I just remember looking at billboards because I was living in a, a big city at the time. So I was looking at billboards and the pictures of the people on the billboard would just be like really scary images of them doing sexual things or being like really um, hurt, badly hurt. Um, and at just like everybody looked, my mind would be like playing tricks on me, I guess. And I would have like associations with everything. Um, like if I saw a flower, I would be like, flower, vagina. <laughs> that means I'm a lesbian. <laughs> so my brain was just making associations with everything. And it was really hard and really scary. At that time, I didn't know what was going on at all. And um, after a couple of weeks, I asked my mom to take me to the ER. Um, so she brought me to the ER and they basically just said I had anxiety and they gave me a doctor's note. So I didn't have to write my midterm exams. So I was happy about that, but it wasn't really helpful at all. Um, and then I went into first year university and. Uh, can you actually describe why just getting labeled as having anxiety wasn't helpful to you at all? Um. Yeah, they didn't, like, the, whoever the doctor was in the ER, it was helpful a little bit because it, it, I was able to give it a name. And, and if any of my friends asked, I, I was just saying, like, oh, I, I'm, I'm having anxiety. And that's what I, I called it for the next, like, few years is just my anxiety. Um, so I guess that was a bit helpful to give it a name, but it didn't give me any resources or it didn't give me like, um, when I, like when I was finally diagnosed with OCD, then I was able to find out so much more about the proper treatment. So. Yeah, that completely makes sense. So go, let's go back to that first year of college. Mm -hmm. What happened from there? Um, so when I was there, I started seeing, um, a, this, like one of the school therapists, and that was helpful in the sense that it was like talk therapy and it didn't really address my OCD, but doing the talk therapy was helpful for talking about like past traumas in my childhood. Like, I think there was a place for that. Um, I really needed to like talk about a lot of that and, and cry a lot and let all that out. And so I think that part actually was therapeutic, but I didn't get, I still didn't get proper treatment or learn any skills. Um, I do remember actually going to a, they suggested a mindfulness workshop, but um, I guess I didn't get either enough information or it was just all so overwhelming. I couldn't really use the tools that I learned in that workshop at all. <laughs> Yeah, so two things that I want to comment on, thank you for bringing them both up, is that it's very true that you could have something that traumatic that happened in your childhood, but just because something did or didn't happen in your childhood doesn't mean that's what creates OCD. So you're um, a great example of having a biological vulnerability to have OCD, and then also some challenging and traumatic things happen to you. So good awareness that it's probably at some point it was 
um, helpful to talk those things through. For some people, actually, when anxiety is hard to tolerate, all other affects are also hard to tolerate. So it can be really hard to talk about really challenging things while you're currently experiencing severe anxiety or OCD. In your case, it sounds like you were able to talk about those more challenging things, but it doesn't mean that your intrusive thoughts um, got any treatment. So that's a great point. Um, the other thing that you're just commenting on is a lot of people say, why not just use in, uh, mindfulness if you're experiencing anxiety or OCD and your point around when you're having so much thought action fusion. So having a thought feels like it's happening and then the urge to do something to try to make it go away is very um, urgent and intense. It's really hard to stay with your thoughts at that point. And so sometimes we've got to do something um, more, or actually the treatment is that we do something um, that's more aggressive than mindfulness. So we go towards it even more through exposure so that eventually mindfulness can be one of the t tools or techniques that we use to um, maintain your progress. Um, so great point that it's not that those skills aren't helpful, but sometimes when you're experiencing severe OCD, you just can't even access those skills. Um, what happened from there? Um, from there, I continued to see different therapists and, um, none of them were that helpful. Um, and do you remember so that, why? Yeah. Do you remember why? Um, mostly because they were just doing like, like I, what I would call talk therapy. I don't really know what it's called, but none of them were able to recognize that I had OCD. So at each new therapist I went to, I would have to talk about all my childhood again. <laughs> and like, it was helpful at the beginning, but after a while I was like, talking about it over and over again with new people is just not helpful. <laughs> so um, yeah, my intrusive thoughts and anxiety uh, weren't being treated at all. Um, so that continued. So it started when I was 18 and I kept going to see different people and it would kind of, my OCD did get a little bit better um, in my second year of university, um, which I think was just due to some different like lifestyle choices that I made. And um, yeah, it's hard to say what it was, but I was just becoming a bit more happy, I guess. And so that kind of helped the intrusive thoughts. Um, but then they, of course, it did come back, and um, yeah, it sounds like your body wasn't as sensitized. But you yeah, uh, as your you still got sensitized at some point, and then your intrusive thoughts would come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it was it was kind of coming and going throughout those years, and then when I was twenty four, I I saw somebody who finally recognized that I had OCD, and I got the diagnosis. Great, and then what was? What happened around that time? How did treatment change for you? So at that time, um, the um, therapist that I was seeing, she had a psychiatrist come in and like diagnose me. And then um, she wasn't really trained in OCD or anxiety. So she was only able to tell me what she knew about ERP. Um, and it was, it was helpful though, because it was the first time I was being introduced to it. Um, so she kind of explained, well, she kind of explained it as like habituating your mind to the thoughts, which like I've learned through huddle that that's not what we're trying to do, but I guess well, I should backtrack a bit <laughs> for being diagnosed, first of all, was just really great because it was the first time that I was like, oh my gosh, this is what is happening. Um, there are other people who are dealing with the same thing and there is a treatment. So that was a really, really good feeling. And learning about ERP, even just the little bit that I learned was helpful for um, some time. What about that? Yeah, I'm really glad, happy to hear that. What about that accurate diagnosis was such a relief to you when you're saying this is what it is? How did, how did that help you? Um, I think it just helped me to like realize I wasn't alone was a big part and to take like a lot of shame um, and judgment away from myself that like I'm not 
crazy and my brain's not defective. Well, I mean, like it kind of is, but um, that there's an actual. You have greater your you have greater biological sensitivity than yes. some people do, and therefore your your everybody has thoughts like you have, and your mind gets stuck on some thoughts more than other people do is the way that I would describe what's happening to you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and I think the therapist I was seeing at that time was the first one that I really like made a connection with and I really trusted her. And, and she said to me, um, because I was having a lot of um, like pedophilia OCD, which I still struggle with. Um, so she said, I would trust you with my kids. And, and she just, made me feel like really good. Like, and like it was really, really hard to tell somebody my, what my thoughts were when I didn't know that I had OCD and when she just didn't judge me and said, yeah, basically that was just really powerful when she said, I would trust you with my kids. Um, that, Stuff. Yeah, it was really conveying how much she didn't think having the thoughts was a, your willpower or your character, but mm-hmm. rather it, it wasn't something you're doing, but rather it's something that's happening to you. And as these types of thoughts show up in your mind, how you respond to them um, increases their intensity and their frequency. Um, not like the more that you have them, the greater threat they are, or the more that it's signaling anything about your character. Yeah, um, so it sounds exactly. like she really conveyed um, that she didn't think it was your character when she said that she would trust you with her kids. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Really mm-hmm. happy to hear that. Can you bring us up to speed with what's been happening more recently? Like what, what have you learned through Huddle that's kind of different than the habituation model? And I can also speak to that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so more recently, what I've been learning is that you're not actually trying to make your intrusive thoughts go away or the anxious sensations, but just um, changing your perspective of how you think of them and um, like going more towards accepting them. And that was a really new idea to me when I learned it. Um, And also I was thinking about it today. And um, even when I started huddle, um, like a, whenever, a few months ago, um, I still, I had the idea at that time that I was working towards like being in recovery, which would be like no intrusive thoughts and no anxious sensations. And my view has totally changed now. Like, um, every day I still have intrusive thoughts or like anxious sensations and I'm l- still learning so much every day, but I think I have really started to um, get like a much closer to accepting it all. Um, like some days are better than others, but my idea of recovery is so different now. So really happy to hear that. Can you, can you describe what your idea of recovery is? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I think it's just like, kind of like what I kind of already said. So just being accepting every day of whatever thoughts and sensations come or, or emotions, because, um, lately my intrusive thoughts have been less, but I'm been working a lot on like emotional perfectionism and my just right OCD. Um, so working a lot on like accepting my emotions and feelings as well, because that is also kind of new to me. (laughs) Yeah. Can you say, and I can explain it too, but in your words, can you explain what emotional perfectionism is? Mm -hmm. Um, So having the idea that you always need to be feeling like good or like neutral, like nothing less than neutral. And whenever you do feel something that's like uh, unpleasant, I guess, um, judging yourself for that. 
Yeah, exactly. So emotional perfectionism would be thinking that you should think or feel a certain way and and then um, resisting against anything you feel and shaming yourself or criticizing yourself if you're feeling something that you think you shouldn't be feeling. Um, so what do you, well, actually let's back up a little bit. So it seems like there's been a variety of different content or I know that there's been a variety of different content that you've struggled with. And by content, I mean um, different themes of intrusive thoughts and that have shown up with a spike of anxiety and then given you the urge to do something to make them go away. Um, so can you speak to maybe some content areas that were easier or harder uh, to work with? And then in general, how you've gotten to this place of acceptance with most of your content areas? Yeah. Um, I was actually thinking about this recently that um like some really challenging content for me would be like sexual orientation, pedophilia and harm OCD and relationship OCD, I think like all of those and the just right OCD is a little bit easier for me. I think just because there's less shame around it, less shame that I put on myself. Yeah. And just for the listeners, I'm just going to put some more words to the Mm -hmm. different content areas that you're describing. So harm OCD is preoccupation with the possibility that you might harm yourself or other people. Relationship OCD tends to be preoccupation with whether you're in the right relationship and either if you love your partner or or your partner loves you or both. Um, Pedophilia OCD is preoccupation with whether or not you're going to hurt a child, particularly in a sexual way. Um, what was the uh, sexual orientation OCD tends to be pre is the preoccupation, uh, with what your sexual orientation is and its impact on your identity or your lifestyle. Um, and can you tell me what, oh, and then not just right OCD, um, is when you're looking for a certain feeling. So this could be in the texture of what you're wearing or what you're touching or something like that, that's more external. Not just right could also be something that you do mentally, but it's just cueing that you're not so concerned with a feared catastrophe occurring if you don't do a compulsion or an avoidance, but rather you just don't like the way that it feels. So what you're saying here is all those other content areas come as you have an intrusive thought about something like that. You also have Um, the feeling of shame that makes it harder to accept that that thought is there where with something that has to do with not just right, you don't tend to feel shame about it. You just really want it to feel right. Yeah. Okay. So first for all of the topics where you typically feel shame, can you talk about how you work through that shame and how you started accepting that those thoughts, it's okay for those thoughts to be there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So... Um, I guess most recently I was struggling with the, um, pedophilia themed OCD because I'm a teacher and I work with young children every day. So I would have an intrusive thought about, um, like wanting to do something sexual with a student and it would give me like a a spike of anxiety, um, and like the urge to ruminate about it, um, And yeah, oh, and I wanted to say another huge thing from coming from Huddle was learning what my compulsion was because when I first learned about ERP, I knew that I was supposed to like expose myself to these things, like my intrusive thoughts, but I didn't know what the compulsion was that I was supposed to be like not doing. So learning about my mental compulsions was a huge part of my recovery. Great. So in this case, what was happening is you were having an unwanted thought about um, something you didn't like related to children. And then probably because you were a teacher, you weren't able to then avoid the kids, which is something that a lot of people with those types of thoughts have. So then you were thinking, well, then what am I doing that's bringing this thought back? And then you started to learn that by ruminating or trying to figure out what the thought meant or why it was there, that's actually what was bringing the thought back. So it was a mental compulsion in the sense that you were trying to figure it out every time it arrived. Yes. Would yeah, you say I anything? didn't know that yeah. I was doing that. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. that And mental compulsions t- is a very common experience for people with OCD. And it is also something that most people don't notice that they're doing. But again, 
Um, this is also common with worry. So with worry, it starts as an uncertain, um, an uncertain thought that, and like kind of an unanswerable question. And then the second part of worry is your attempt to try to figure it out. So people who worry are constantly trying to figure out uh, what the answer might be to the thing they're worried about or trying to figure out why they're worrying in the first place. And that's what's keeping it going. So you can think about it like functionally similar in an in unwanted intrusive thought that you have an unwanted intrusive thought. It arrives with a spike of anxiety. You try to do something in your mind to make it go away. And in this case, it's trying to figure out why you had it in the first place. And the more you try to figure it out, the more stuck it gets. So once you realize that that was a compulsion, what'd you do differently once you had those intrusions? Um, so, well, what I would do is, um, I guess, yeah, whether it was like um, an incidental, is that what it's called? <laughs> uh, an intentional exposure or an incidental yeah. exposure. So yeah. that's, thank you for cueing those words. I'll just explain. So an intentional exposure would be to say, I know that, um, I'm going towards something that's going to be a trigger for me and I'm going to intentionally plan to go towards it so that I can intentionally practice my new skill. An incidental exposure is something that just shows up in the context of your life and you just got to be ready with your new strategy to do something effective. So mm, for right. you, whether it was intentional or incidental, mm. what was your strategy? Yeah. So yeah, either way, my strategy was to um, t say to myself, I recognize that I'm having this thought and it's giving me these sensations and I would um, like say to myself what they were. So sometimes it'd be like butterflies in my stomach or sometimes it would feel like um, my diaphragm like tightening um, or even sometimes I would have um, or like often I would have like a groinal sensation. So I would recognize all the sensations and the thought in my mind and I then I would say to myself, um, so I'm going to let these thoughts and sensations be there. And then like the thing that I learned from you, Maggie, was to say full stop, <laughs> because anything past the thought, it would be like me doing a compulsion and ruminating. So after having the thought, it would be like a full stop. This is what I recognize. And now I'm going to bring myself to the present moment. And the way that I did that was always like doing the five senses kind of like, um, strategy. So, um, I wouldn't even really count. Like, so I know that there's like the five things you see, four things, whatever, counting them, but I usually would just be like, this is what I see. This is what I smell. This is what I taste. This is what I feel. And this is what I hear in this moment to bring myself back to the moment. And whenever the thought would come back or the sensations, um, I would, try and just bring myself back to the present um, and continuing to do that and just letting all of that be there. Yeah. yeah, all of that is great. So first off, just noticing, so you did a really good job identifying what your trigger was and then what your initial sensations are. So it's common whenever people have anxiety that their diaphragm shifts and they get butterflies in their stomach. Good awareness that you might also get sensations in your groin. And that's across the board for, for everyone. People that don't have unwanted intrusive thoughts and aren't hypersensitive to the sensations that they're having might not notice that they have sensations like that. But if you have um, really unwanted intrusive thoughts in any taboo topic, you might also, in particular, uh, they might stick around because you're afraid that the sensations that you have in your body are meaningful. And then the more attention you pay to the sensations in your body, the more, the more prominent they seem. And then you're on a vicious cycle of why am I having these thoughts and why am I having these sensations? So great job um, noticing that you were having sensations. And then you were noticing that like, it's okay to have the thought full stop. Now I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm not going to analyze what sensations I have or do anything to make them go away. And when you're saying you were using like the five-step grounding technique, from my perspective, that's so that anything can be both an exposure and a compulsion. And in this case, some people might use a grounding technique to try to make their anxiety go away. But it sounds like you were effectively using it 
to shift your attention away from analyzing what was happening in your mind or your body. And by bringing yourself back into the present moment and then shifting your attention away, you are actually living with the possibility that you were doing something terribly wrong and that you were a horrible person that was about to hurt someone. So it was a big leap of faith to say, rather than figuring out this thought and its meaning, I'm going to shift my attention back to the present moment and pay attention to what's happening around me. And it sounds like once you made the leap of faith and redirected your attention to what was happening around you, then you were able to bring any anxiety you had along as you went about your day. Um, Does that fit your experience? Yes. Yeah. And would you add anything else to that? Um, No, just that it's been getting easier doing that Um, because I've been, um, I guess like each time I'm successful at it, it gives me more confidence the next time. So lately I've just been saying like, I'm, I'm excited about my day because like not just saying that to make myself feel better, like, cause I really love my job. So I'm just like, I'm going to let myself enjoy this day, even though I'm having these thoughts and sensations. So, yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine that that must've been part of the really painful part of having OCD, that OCD hijacks, whatever it is that you love. And so it sounds like it was taking away the thing that you loved, which is your job. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And did it prior to making the commitment to saying that it's okay for me to enjoy my day while I have thoughts and sensations that I don't like, uh, was that also a leap of faith for you? Um, like before I learned all the skills, is that what you mean? Yeah. Or even in the context of like when I presented it for the first time or the first dozen times Mm -hmm. and you hadn't tried it out, like, I love what you're saying about, once I started doing it, then it beca- I was gaining more and more experiential confidence that I could like relate to this with the new strategy again, because mm-hmm. you were finding that um, not, uh, really, actually, why were, you, why were you getting confidence as you had more experiential um, commitments to taking a leap of faith? Um, I think because some days once I started working, um, I like being like my job really brings me into the present. So that's a really great thing about it. So sometimes the, um, thoughts and sensations would just pass on their own just because I would get so into what I was doing. And then by the end of the day, it would kind of be like, Oh, remember that I was having that anxiety this morning, but it it doesn't really matter anymore. But even on the days where it wouldn't go away, um, I guess I just kind of learned or have been learning to just kind of be like, it's my friend now, (laughs) like it's just here (laughs) and it's okay if it's there. And I'm just becoming a bit less afraid of it Um, and noticing more that it's like kind of the sensations that I was so scared of more than the thoughts in a sense. Really happy to hear that. Yes. And then when it comes to all the other themes that you were having, were you able to generalize the practice that you were doing from in one content area over to other content areas or how were those related? Yeah, definitely. Um, so pretty much like whatever my unwanted intrusive thought is, I try to just say to myself, like maybe, so if it's like a relationship related, um, then I would just say like, oh yeah, maybe my husband is going to cheat on me and leave me. And when I try to go to like the worst case scenario, so I get the most like anxious and the most thought after fusion. So I would just be like, maybe he's going to cheat on me and he doesn't love me. And then we'll get a divorce and then I won't be able to live without him. So then I'll just decide to kill myself. Um, because that has been part of my harm OCD as well as like the fear of one day wanting to kill myself. So I usually just do that, take it to the worst case scenario and notice how I feel like the sensations. And, um, and then if I really have the urge to ruminate, like sometimes if another thought does pop into my head, another question, I usually just go with like maybe and, and just try sticking with that. And yeah, you just it works with the for all content. 
Yeah, that's great. You just go towards the uncertainty. So what you're, uh, that's just really brave. What um, gives you the willingness to just try to get as much thought action fusion as possible? Um, I guess, well, what gives me the willingness? Um, maybe that I know that the more that I practice, not like the easier it's going to get, but the, I don't know, the more, like the more willing I'll become, but that's yeah. like a backwards answer. Cause, <laughs> cause it's like, I'm willing because if I do it more, I'll be more willing. That's a great answer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it's a circular answer, but it's a great hmm. answer. Um, what helped you b- trust the strategy? Cause that's what I'm really hearing you, what you mm-hmm. you say, you're, you're trusting the strategy across many content areas mm-hmm. and you're able to shift the details of the techniques that you use because you trust the strategy overall, which is that I've got to get to the point where I can accept the existence of this thought and the possibility that it arrives in my mind. And I can accept the sensations that come with it without adding second fear or resistance. So what's the question again? Yeah. So, so what, what helped you trust the strategy? Oh, um, I think it was really like, it's hard to say what it was the very first time, but I think after those few times that it was successful, that that's what helped each time after that, I was like, I know that I can do this. Um, but I think the first time it was just that I felt like there was no other, um, like there was no other choice. Yeah. I was like, I can either suffer, be anxious and suffer, or I can be anxious and try to move towards acceptance. Really glad to hear it. And perhaps that's something that we can end on that basically you had the guts to trust the strategy because you've been suffering for so long. And this is probably the first time you've really heard it framed up this way, but you could tell that it's something that you hadn't tried and given everything else that you tried, it was just worth it to take a leap of faith and try it. And then once you started trying it, you, you liked the results and it made you more and more willing. Yeah, exactly. I guess I felt like I had nothing to lose, so I might as well try. Yeah. Well, I really like that attitude. That sounds great. Uh, we'll end here for now, but we'll be back next time to talk more about that. Thanks so much for your time, Stephanie. Thank you. Okay.